And now back to Glen Rose, Texas. But now back to Peru. Oh, all right. After we left the Amazon jungles lecturing together, mm -hmm. flew back to um, Lima. You went to a speaking appointment. Uh, I was joined by Dr. Dennis Swift, who's been on this program a number of times. Mm -hmm. I actually, I joined his group at that point because they had medical supplies for the refugees uh, from the earthquake, the mm -hmm. victims from the earthquake, medical supplies and toys. Once those were delivered, then we flew the Nazca lines. Wow. Exciting. You yeah. Wow. I find it just as exciting as you do, John. Now, viewers, I feel like it's my responsibility to tell you this early. Soak up all that John Morris Pendleton-y goodness while you can, because he's going to be a lot less involved in the rest of this video than we'd all like. Uh, there are hundreds of them in all directions. They, they relate to uh, the sky god of uh, the people of Nazca. Mm -hmm. And that civilization died out about 500 A.D. A little later than that, but I won't quibble over a couple centuries. There are huge iconoglyphs. Now that name is, that technical name is probably not familiar mm. to uh, this audience except for a few. So few, in fact, that a Google Scholar search for this technical name returns only one result, whereas geoglyph and iconograph get thousands. Apparently only Karl Baugh and Stephanie Strauss know such high-level technical terminology. Uh, but there's Condor, uh, about a hundred yards in length. Uh, the sketch, there's uh, the sketch of uh, a hummingbird that's almost that large, monkey, spider, etc. Monkey and spider, right. Well, this is a good time to do something a little weird, because that guy you were in the plane with, Dennis Swift, is kind of important in all this, since he's where you're getting your ideas from. Oh, Dennis, could you come in here, please, and tell us about the spider? If you don't like spiders, this is a good opportunity to look away. What we're looking at here is a spider that's about 50 yards long, half the distance of a football field. It is the Rinchinilia spider. Rinchinilia? Nice try, Dennis, but I think you're a little ways off the mark. Look, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it either, but it's sure as hell not Rinchinilia. It looks more like Rinchinilia or something. You sound like you're adding in like a bunch of extra letters. Is the rarest of all arachnid spiders. Ah yes, the rarest of all spiders. The kind that isn't a spider. Yeah, it's spidery looking, but it's not a true spider. It's about the size of a dot at the end of a sentence. Barely detectable by the human eye. That's odd, because every source I've found says the body length of the American genera Cryptocellus and Pseudocellus range from 3 all the way up to 8 or even 10 millimeters long. If you're making your periods that big, Dennis, you're wasting a lot of ink. But they not only drew it at large dimensions. Did they? Let's compare. So here are some pictures of Cryptocellus and Pseudocellus. The first thing most people are going to notice, I think, is that the longest legs by far are the second legs, second from the front. They're huge compared to the others. This isn't depicted at all in the Nazca line spider. And the second thing people will notice, if they're carefully comparing against your image, is that there's no separate head segment on these animals. Because these animals look like spiders, and spiders don't have that. Whereas the Nazca line spider shows a clear narrowing at the, let's call it the neck, with a separate head and some sort of attachments on the front of it. As a matter of fact, if I ignore the extra set of legs, in body shape I would say this almost looks closer to an ant than to a spider. And regardless, it looks nothing at all like the arachnid that you're talking about. So what makes you think that's what they made an image of? But there was a discovery made in 1959. Now, this species of spider lives in the Amazon in caves about a thousand miles away. Which species? You didn't name a species, or even a genus. Not even a family. You named a whole order. But, okay, if it really did live a thousand miles away and it was barely large enough to see, then that'd be even more evidence against the drawing actually being of one. It has no eyes, and they found that during reproduction that it extends the third leg. Yes. As a protusable tube with a symbium at the end. With a what beam at the end? Dude, are you even using real words? Okay, look, here's the reality. So basically, the third leg on each side on the males has a foot that's modified with a copulatory apparatus. Basically, a little tube that can be used to inject sperm into the female. If a diagram's not good enough, here's a photo. Now, what you're saying here is that this Nazca art piece is depicting that tube with a massive extra chunk of leg flying off to the side, as big as the entire leg. 
Well, you can see with your own eyes here that that's nowhere close to the truth. But if it were, remember I said this is on both legs. Meaning what, they forgot to put the same thing on the left side? Come on, Dennis. You can only see this with a very high-powered microscope. A biologist discovered it at Boston University in 1959. Now, how in the world did the ancient Noscan people, 2 to 300 BC, accurately draw the arachnid spider not only without eyes, now I have other Noskin vases from the same period, they, they have spiders of different species with the eyes on them, but they drew it without the eyes and, and with an extension proboscis. of the pertussible tube with the symbiont. It's a very small symbiont. Well, I don't know, Dennis. Maybe the ancient astronauts came and taught the Nazcans how to use high-powered microscopes so they could learn to draw laughably inaccurate anatomical diagrams of obscure arachnids from a thousand miles away. Maybe that's what happened, Dennis. Or maybe it's just a stylized drawing of a generic spider, and the extra lines and the lack of eyes are just a product of how they made it, considering that the totally anatomically correct monkey Carl mentioned also has that same extra line and no eyes, and so does the, uh, well, that's supposed to be a dog, huh? Well, so does the dog. Extra lines, no eye. It's almost as if when you're creating a drawing out of a single continuous line starting from a different location, you need an entry and an exit point, and you end up with no eye because that's not along the path of your line. Or at least that's what I might think if the devil was making me close my mind to God or whatever. That's what this whole show is about, right? God Jesus Bible? Well, I know you never actually tell us what it has to do with that, so I guess there's no point asking. Get out of here, Dennis! Stop wasting my time! John, where are you at? But what caught the attention of a global audience through Eric Von Deniken was the astronaut. So there among the lines is a fellow apparently with a helmet, apparently with something like goggles or large eyes, He's holding something in his arms, and uh, so Eric Von Daniken said, that's an astronaut. Yeah, funny how people see things in these drawings that aren't actually there, eh? Hey, Carl. And he published Chariot of the Gods, Chariots of the Gods, sold 360 million copies. What? Really? That is an extreme exaggeration, Carl. The first Harry Potter book is a massive global hit, and it sold 120 million copies, which puts it extremely close to the top of the list of best-selling books of all time. And you're gonna tell me Chariots of the Gods outsold it three times over? Whose ass are you pulling that number out of? Affected a generation by stating that these lines were actually the lines for extraterrestrial craft mm -hmm. and that was the astronaut welcoming mm -hmm. in symbol uh, his fellow space travelers. Yeah, so is that how you and Dennis explain the Nazcans drawing a spider that lived in a cave a thousand miles away and is so small they could barely see it and definitely not know about its reproduction? Because if you're just going to ignore Occam's razor and propose that they drew a creature they never lived anywhere near and should never have known about, then you kind of have to explain it before anyone takes it seriously. Ancient astronauts are a pretty dumb explanation, but at least there's something. Now, of course, you know, he started with the presupposition, the thought, that men no way could have been smart enough to have done this himself. Correct. Wait, they were smart enough to do what themselves? Become astronauts? Imagine astronauts? Or just make big pictures, which is totally irrelevant to the astronaut thing? But we're finding out exactly the opposite. Exactly. They were superior. That, that ancient man was extremely more intelligent in many cases than we, yes. we're finding things today that they knew hundreds, thousands of years ago. That's right. What things are we finding? How to move rocks to make big pictures on the ground? Yeah, John, we don't need them to figure that out. If people thought it was important enough to spend the time, anyone could have drawn animals 10 miles across in the dirt. I agree these people could do these things without some external help because it just takes ingenuity and effort, and humans had that back then just like they do now. And these lines really do show a great deal of ingenuity and effort. Totally agree. Regular viewers might recall me getting annoyed about this a couple times in the past, when religious apologists insist that someone from an older civilization couldn't have figured out how to do some relatively impressive thing because they must have been totally irrational, unintelligent savages. And so it must have come to them from God! It's a complete nonsense argument, because humans are clever no matter what time they're from. But to claim that they weren't just of fully human intelligence, but actually superior in their intelligence or knowledge or abilities is just... I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, don't you think? Yay, they can make big lines. Well, we can make bigger, better lines faster if we want to. So what? And uh, the Naskins had an ability with geometry that's astounding. I flew those lines not long ago. Mm -hmm. 
in a small airplane. Dr. Dennis Swift was behind me. It was a small plane. He and his wife were behind me. And he said, look, the rays of the sun were just right. That's not an astronaut. In his left hand is a net. In his right hand are three stringers, each with a fish on it. He was a fisherman, not an astronaut. Ah, but Carl, it has the clear features of an astronaut. Can't you see its obvious space helmet and space goggles? How could the Nazcan people have known about the gear required for space travel unless they were visited by spacemen, Carl? The fact that it's holding a fish doesn't explain that, it just dodges the question. It just means they saw the ancient astronauts go fishing. Carl, do you see how terrible this reasoning is? Well, clearly you do, or you would think it was an astronaut. So why did you accept the story about that spider, even though it has the exact same kind of inconsistencies as an explanation as the astronaut explanation? Because Dennis Swift said it, and he's a godly creationist man, unlike Eric Von Daniken with his heretical alien beliefs? Then we saw the monkey and the spiders and the star, and then Dr. Swift said, all right, it's now time to see the dinosaurs that we discovered. Oh, now I'm starting to get it. So this pilot took us through a, a shallow canyon to another plateau, and there were four different dinosaur profiles. Clear and unambiguous dinosaurs, or dinosaurs in the same way there was an astronaut and a spider thingy with a sperm injector on its foot. I'm gonna expect something remarkable here, Carl, because if these dinosaurs could also be imprecise stylized depictions of something else, I'm gonna laugh my ass off at your double standard now that you've rejected that astronaut thing. Meaning that among the hummingbirds and the condors and the whales that were represented, all creatures that were alive and still alive today, they represented other creatures they saw. Uh, there were two big sauropods, long-necked dinosaurs like this. Mm -hmm. There was a triceratops, and there was a raptor. Wow. Wow, indeed, John. I kind of wish you'd talk more, buddy, but I gotta work with what I got. Ah, oh, well, we had two really great episodes of you, so that's okay. Now we get to focus on Carl a bit, who, after all, is the star of this series, even if I wish you were. All right, Carl, two sauropods, one triceratops, and a raptor. I went looking high and low to figure out which lines you might be talking about, because you don't bother to actually show us any of them here. And I found a couple things, specifically the exact triceratops you're referring to, and what you might be calling a raptor, but I'm not sure. I still have absolutely no clue which ones you think are sauropods. Even among creationists, I didn't find anyone claiming that, let alone providing pictures, so we'll just pretend you didn't say that, I guess. So to start with, here's what you might be calling a raptor. And I only say that because if you search for Nazca Lines dinosaur, this is the one other creationists also claim is a dinosaur. And as you can see, it's a bird. About as true to life as the spider and the astronaut, but a bird nonetheless. So it is a dinosaur, just not the kind of dinosaur you're thinking of. That's the raptor dealt with. For the Triceratops, we're gonna need Dennis back, so Dennis, get back in here, we need you! One of the dinosaurs, we now have documented three different dinosaurs. We know that this one's about 60 meters long and it is a Pachycephalosaurus dinosaur. Pachycephalosaurus, in fact, there's a, a, a rendition of a Pachycephalosaurus yes. dinosaur. And that we means have boneheaded lizard. I thought Carl Baugh meant boneheaded lizard. Well, the Noskin people had to have seen living, breathing right. dinosaurs. They did? That went by pretty fast. I'm sure you're right, but let's just go back and review and make sure we didn't miss anything, eh? So here's your Pachycephalosaurus. I tried to find some better images of it, but I can't find any images of it at all. Doesn't matter though, I guess it's fine, people can see it well enough. So let's just put the one you pointed at side by side with your artist's depiction. So the geoglyph has a really long, floppy tail that droops down. The real thing doesn't. The geoglyph has an extremely bulbous head, and the real thing doesn't. Maybe the Nazkins wanted to depict a Pachycephalosaurus astronaut so they put a fishbowl on its head. And the geoglyph is clearly quadrupedal with four thick, stumpy, short legs of about equal size, whereas the real thing is a biped with two big hind legs and two little front legs, all relatively long and sleek by comparison. So what are you seeing here that I'm not? I don't know if you're seeing anything I'm not, but I think I'm seeing a couple things you're not, specifically the other two figures drawn nearby. That is clearly an astronaut. I mean, a human. A severely inaccurate, stylized, cartoonish human, but a human. Really goes to show the level of accuracy these things reach. And beside it is something similar to your Pachycephalosaurus, but with a shorter tail and a weirdly curvy head. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that what you're calling the head is actually the tail, and what you're calling the tail is actually the head. And that these might just be depictions of giant anteaters. 
Look at them. All that hair makes them look like they have those thick, stumpy legs, and the poofy tail could match both the curvy and the round tails in the pictures, and their snout looks an awful lot like what you're calling tails in the pictures there. Now, of course, I'm not saying that absolutely is the correct answer, because these images lack way too much detail for that kind of proclamation, so I'll leave the leaping to conclusions to you guys. But considering that it's an animal from the region that we know lived at the time of the Nazgans, and considering that Pachycephalosaurus fossils are found in the United States, nowhere near near Peru, it's an awful lot more plausible as a guess. And here's another that on that flight I described at the top of the program, you had the pilot take me to see. Dennis, that is a Triceratops dinosaur. Yes. No. Now let's be clear on what we're talking about. I wouldn't want to misrepresent you, Dennis. This is up at Papa, and flying over, this is almost 50 meters long, and it has a head crest, back, and then it has horns here, and then down here, a distinctive. I'm going to point it out. You look closer, closer. We measured in the horns and everything. And it's similar to stylized, but it looks somewhat like a Styracosaurus. So we're talking about Styracosaurus, not Triceratops. Fine. I'll put the geoglyph next to one of your drawings for comparison. And I'll take the one that looks the most similar just to make it as easy for you as possible. And also since this one isn't even a Styracosaurus at all, I think it's a Chasmosaurus. Hopefully everyone can see that okay, the lines don't show up that well. I tried to adjust the contrast and stuff, but it is what it is. So the geoglyph has a nice slim body, a long slim tail, long slim legs, smaller forelegs than hind legs, and it actually even looks like it might be standing standing up a bit. Your image, Dennis, has a thick body, a thick short pointed tail, and thick short legs. So it's already not looking very close. But the real problem here is the head. You say it has a head crest, by which I assume you mean the neck frill, but it doesn't. It's just not there. At least it does have some spiny looking things on its head, but where's the one on its nose? It doesn't have that either. So it's missing like the key features of a Styracosaurus. I'm sorry, but nothing about this looks like your picture in any way. Now that's not to say that it absolutely could not represent a Styracosaurus, but it is to say that if it is one, it's made in such a way that it looks very little like one. Meaning that anyone claiming to have definitively identified it as one is either a fraud or a fool. Especially since Styracosaurus fossils, just like Pachycephalosaurus are found nowhere near Peru, but instead in the western US and Canada. As for what else it could be, that's equally unclear. Once again, we run into the problem that's encountered with a lot of these Nazca and Palpa depictions, which is that they weren't created to be perfectly lifelike. So this is one of the ones we can only guess at. I'd think maybe it's a lizard of some sort. Iguanas have spines kind of like that. That said, it doesn't look much more like an iguana than it does like your Styracosaurus, but these images are so extremely stylized that that's the whole core of the confusion, isn't it? It might not even represent one animal. It could be a mix of animals or even a whole fictional animal. I asked I asked my Twitter followers, at logic what they thought, and some people had some really interesting ideas, but unfortunately I wasn't fully convinced by any of them. Maybe my commenters will have some more ideas and can figure it out after some arguing. But regardless, Dennis, almost any idea would make more sense than your idea. But we're here to argue, so for the sake of argument, let's say it is a dinosaur. Just for a second, I'll give it to you and run with the idea. Well, your point here is that if these people depicted a dinosaur, then they must have lived with dinosaurs, right? But just before you were arguing that people depicted a spider that they lived nowhere near, which means people don't have to live anywhere near an animal or have any experience with it to draw it to apparently anatomical perfection. A spider in a cave a thousand miles away that can barely be seen with the naked eye and with reproductive features that can only be seen through a high-powered microscope is just as far removed from these people as a dinosaur that died out tens of millions of years previously. Maybe they just took the ayahuasca and they saw the dinosaurs of the past and the astronauts of the future and the spiders from a thousand miles away in their spiritual visions. And we will see that it is a Triceratops type species of dinosaur. It has the crest, it has two horns at the top, it has the mouth, and then... Making three horns all together. Yes, three horns or something vaguely horn-like on top of the head, sweeping backwards and no nose horn in sight. But hold on, now you're saying it's a Triceratops, not a Styracosaurus? A Triceratops with two horns at the top and three horns altogether, totally unlike a Styracosaurus. Which is it, Dennis? You can, you can see that this is truly and really a dinosaur. 
No question about it. Maybe there should be, Carl. Remember the astronaut, boys. Turns out you had exactly the double standard I predicted. I'll laugh my ass off, but in private after the video. All right, fuck off, Dennis. Get John back in here and let's finish this. Absolutely incredible, meaning that within the last few thousand years, we have evidence, classic evidence, that dinosaurs were still alive. Uh-huh. And of course, the book of Job a few thousand years ago was written. Now, Nazca is very close to Ica, Peru. That's correct. And they, we have all these Ica stones with etchings that tell all kinds of stories. And we have all dinosaurs that we know today etched hundreds, thousands of years ago by the Icas, <coughs> which were uh, neighbors to the Nazca people. And, and their burial stones and some of their motifs describe Visually and graphically, these dinosaurs, Triceratops and others, sauropods, fighting with a T-Rex or Allosaurus-type dinosaur, riding some. So, in other words, we have, we are surrounded by dinosaurs. John, did you really need to get us started down that path? I wish you had more interesting stuff to say. I'd love to be able to interact with you just that little bit more. But the Ica stones, really? They're a joke. It's not even worth my time talking about that hoax. Listen, Trey the Explainer did a video on the origins and failings of this hoax, and it takes him like 15 minutes to get through it all, and it's just not worth me repeating it all here. So I'll link that video in the description so people can learn about it on their own time. And that's it for the Ica stones. But John, I've really enjoyed spending this time with you. Not so much Carl, but certainly with you. I can only hope that someday we'll have the chance to meet again. It has been an honor and a privilege to speak with a man in such a distinguished lab coat. Thank you for your service. So again, the Bible is found to be scientifically correct, which brings me to the greatest theme in all the Bible. That theme involves you. It's your story. God so loved the world. That's enough out of you, Carl. We've all heard sermons before, no need for another one. But Carl, thank you very much for giving me a fresh dose of Pendleton. I really enjoyed that. And thanks to everyone for watching. If you liked it, thumb it up and subscribe, and I'll bring you more stuff like this in the future. And if you really like my stuff, consider supporting me on Patreon like my VIPs here on the screen. I don't know how I'm going to top a new John Pendleton video, but I'll try my best, guys. See you next time.